in our study, during our study of chapter 6, during the fifth seal, we caught a glimpse of Revelation 6, 9, and I want to read that to you. Revelation 6, 9, it says, Of those who had been slain for the word of God and for their, for their testimony which they held. You might remember them. They were clothed in white robes, and they were asking for the Lord. Lord, how long? How long? You know, it's funny. We're, we're, we're weird people. Human beings are weird people. If you just sit somewhere, if you go into a mall or you go anywhere, go into a restaurant, just sit in the corner and watch people. People are strange, but that's what makes them fun. That's what makes them unique. But here we are, we say, God, come quickly. Maranatha, God, come quickly. And then when our time comes, we're going, no, God, no, God, no, God. Give me another day, give me another week, give me another three weeks, 15 years wasn't enough for Hezekiah, worst time of his life when he asked for that extra time. So it's kind of strange. On one hand, we believe by faith that we go from here into the presence of God, but when that time begins to come for us, we hang on because that survival instinct is so strong, we hang on for dear life. Well, we see these saints before the throne, and he's asking, the, the whole group is asking God, how long will it be? before you avenge our blood. And we talked about those who will come to know the Lord during the tribulation, those tribulation saints. And as Pastor Dan has said, how are they going to come to know the Lord? Well, hopefully through a lot of testimony to those before the church is raptured, hopefully through the witnesses, the two witnesses that will be placed on the earth during the tribulation, and hopefully from, um, who knows, maybe a few plaques in our church, I mean, in our homes that talk about Jesus, those things that you have hanging around, the witness that you've given to your parents. You know, I often think when the, the church is raptured and the Christians are gone, all of those homes that you worry about paying for, they're going to be empty, Right? They're going to be empty. There's not going to be anyone in those homes. So what do you think is going to happen? Well, now the government's going to try to get involved, and they're going to try to take everything for themselves, right? We, we know that that's true. But before that happens, what do you think is going to happen to those who are less, uh, uh, have less moral value than most? They're going to come into your home or break into your home, and they're going to take everything in your home that is of any value. So hopefully they steal some of those Christian paintings that you have and they, you know, the Bibles that you have laying around, the tracts that you have laying around. You know, your home can be a testimony. Chapter 8 is an answer to the prayers of these saints as well as the prayers of every single saint, every generation even before ours and the ones that come after ours. It is that answer, God, please make things right. Because the Lord doesn't strike us dead when we sin, there is a tendency to think that we're getting by with everything, or the world is getting by with everything, but that is simply not true. God is still on the throne. He has said that without Jesus Christ, you stand before him alone. You have to answer for what you have done in your life. If you have Jesus, Jesus answers for you. So that time is coming, this judgment upon the earth. As Dr. Henry Morris puts it, the author of the Revelation record, he says this, there was only one seal yet to be opened, but it would unleash more fury than all had that, that had gone before. Now, please keep in mind that this seventh seal of judgment was within the seven trumpets, right? So remember I told you it was kind of like a, um, um, a telescope to where you have the seals, you have one section of the telescope, another section of the telescope, and another section of the telescope. That's kind of how these judgments unfold. There's one, and then there's another one inside that, and another one inside of that, and another one inside of that. So as we begin our study, let's pray together. Father, we ask that your Holy Spirit would guide us this morning. Father, you've said that where two or more are gathered together that you're in the midst of them. And Father, we know that even when it's just us, you live in our hearts. But Father, I pray this morning that if there is anybody here that does not know you, and I don't mean know of you or know about you, but know you, given their heart 
to you, made you their Lord and their Savior, made you their best friend, that, Father, this morning's teaching would speak to that. It would speak to that emptiness, to that loneliness, and that they would give their hearts to you this morning, Father. We pray for anyone here this morning that might not know you. Lord, we also pray for the saints. May you help us to not grow weary in well-doing, but to remember that this is a marathon. It's not a 50-yard dash. It's a race that we race all of our lives. So, Father, help us. If we've unplugged from serving you, I pray that we'd plug back in. Father, if we've grown weary or just plain old lazy, I pray that you'd help us to know and understand there's a, a large world out there that needs your love and needs to know that they don't have to live the way they're living. They can give their hearts to you and you can make life so much better. So, Father, I pray for any of us that may be backslidden or we've just grown lazy and you, you, would, you would prompt us to get back in the game. We love you, Lord, and we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Revelation chapter 8, verse 1. When he opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven for about half an hour. Now, I believe that that's proof that there will be no women in heaven. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Okay, you guys know me, okay? You guys know me, okay? So I can get by that, by with that here at my own church. I would never say that at another church. You guys know me and you know my wife and you know how much I, how much I love her and how much I respect her. Silence in heaven for one hour. Now, before this time, what a, what a, a contrast in what's going on. Because prior to this time, heaven and earth are filled with sound from all of these judgments. Everything that's going on, all the noise, all the, the, the dying, all the famine, all that's happening. There's so much noise. And then all of a sudden in heaven, one hour. And you know, does it mean one hour, 60 seconds, 60 minutes? No, I don't think that's what it means. One hour, you know, one day is, uh, to the Lord is different than what we think it is. So we're not exactly sure what that one hour is. But again, prior to this, you had a multitude, and they were shouting and praising before the throne, as well as what's going on at earth. There's, there's war, there's shouts of fear, there's shouts of blasphemy. But here, it's like this moment of silence before this final, or this seventh seal gets unleashed. It's like anticipating the coming events. Look at verse 2. And I saw the seven angels who stand before God, and to them were given the seven trumpets. Now, many people believe that these are none other than Michael and Gabriel and seven other archangels not mentioned specifically in Scripture. Now, I'm going to give you a maybe here, but I really want to preface it with you that you know it's a maybe. It's only speculation because... The Word of God does not say this, but the Jewish tradition uh, in a book called Enoch, they suggest that the names of these other, other five angels are Raphael, Uriel, Sakharel, and Raguel. Raguel, R-A-G-U-E-L, Raguel, we'll call him that. But again, it's not in scriptures, it's only conjecture. But that's not the point. It really doesn't matter what their names are. Whatever their names are, they stand by at God's beck and call. They do what God wants them to do. So they're already standing at ready to do what the Lord asks them to do. I wish that I was that ready all the time. Don't you? Wish that I was ready? No, I'm just kidding. That you, don't you wish that you were ready? Whatever God said, that you were like, yes, Father, I hear you. Whatever it is you want me to do, I'm willing to do it. We have a tendency while we're here on this earth to try to negotiate you know, with God. He says he wants us to do something. We try to, we're a little uncomfortable, so we tone it down. We do it part way. You know, we ask him to modify it a little bit. But in heaven, they know who God is. 
There, there's no doubt. There's no question in their mind. And when God says jump, they jump. When he tells them to do something, they know that he's absolutely right. So he, they do exactly what he asks them to do. Look at verse 3. Then another angel, having a golden censer, came and stood at the altar. He was given much incense that he should offer it with the prayers of all the saints upon the golden altar which was before the throne. Now I want you to notice how the prayers and the incense is linked together. This particular angel operates in a privileged role that the other angels do not have. He's kind of pulled out and given this privilege. We see him preparing to present the intercessions of God's people to the Lord himself. There again, God doesn't miss a prayer. He acts as a mediator, if you will, between men and God. Interesting. That's a unique role in scriptures. When you have a priest who is a mediator between men and God and God and men. So we see this angel in a priestly role, if you will. In 1 Timothy 2.5, it tells us there is one... One mediator between God and men, and that man is who? Jesus Christ. That man is Jesus Christ. So, again, based on this priestly ministry of this angel, it could be the Lord himself. There's a lot of things in the book of Revelation you can't nail down because God doesn't let you nail it down. Sometimes he doesn't give us the absolute specifics. And then there's other times when he'll speak kind of cryptic. And then the next verse he'll tell you exactly what it is. So if it's cryptic, it's usually there for a reason. Revelation 5 verse 8, if you flip there. Revelation 5 8. Kind of helps us to understand what is going on here. The scene that is set before the throne. Revelation 5 8. Now when he, the Lamb of God, had taken the scroll and the four living creatures and the 24 elders, they fell down before the Lamb, each having a harp and golden bowls full of what? Full of incense, incense which are what? The prayers of the saints. You see, when we pray, it is a sweet thing to God. God loves to hear us pray. Don't you kind of like it sometimes when your children depend upon you? Now, I started to say when they ask you for something, but that gets old, doesn't it? Because kids ask you for something all the time. But when they depend upon you, when it's a sincere need, you kind of like that. That's what you're here for. If you have children, that's your role. It's to protect them, to keep them safe, to take care of them. So there's a certain part of that that warms your heart, that they look to you as daddy or they look to you as mama or grandma or grandpa and they trust in you and they care about you and it makes you feel good inside. God loves it when we pray. And you know what? We don't... I'm always careful when I get to this because I know you can make people feel guilty because none of us pray as much as we should. And, and I don't believe that that's God's heart in it. Yes, he wants us to pray more, but the enemy is God's enemy. Satan is the author of guilt. God is the author of redemption. God is also the God of conviction. Now, he may lay some conviction on you and say, you know, we need to spend a little more time together. But not the guilt that sometimes is laid on us. And uh, sometimes pastors, we use the scriptures to lay that guilt upon people. But we don't pray as often as we should. And I think most of us wish that we prayed even more because it makes the Father happy. The Lord loves for us to pray. I was just thinking today, you know, it's so easy to get involved in a project or something, and you realize it's been hours before you've even acknowledged God for whatever it might be, the day, the job, the, the task before you. And for some people, I think that goes into days, plural. And it goes into maybe for some folks, even weeks. 
and we've not gone to our dad and asked him or even acknowledged that he is alive. It's kind of like your kids when they get married and they move, you know, they move away and they never call you. You know, as a parent, you love to hear that voice. It doesn't matter if they're three. It doesn't matter if they're 33 or 43 or 53. You still like hearing that child's voice. So, when people pray, it is a sweetness to the Lord. Now, why is it a sweetness to the Lord? I want you to think about this. Just because it's a prayer? No. Why do you think it's a sweetness to God? Because of His Son. Because you see, God's not obligated to answer our prayers without Jesus. He's not obligated to. When you and I pray, it's because we have that intercessor between us and God. We have that bridge between us and God. So when we go to the Lord and ask for prayer, every single prayer reminds Him of Jesus. Every single prayer reminds Him of His Son. So the prayers are very, very sweet to the Lord. In Romans 8, 32, if you have your Bibles and want to turn there. Romans 8, 32. Who is he who condemns? It is Christ who died, and furthermore, also risen, who is even at the right hand of God, who makes intercession for us. Who's the one that condemns? Not Jesus. He makes intercession for us. When you've given your life to Jesus Christ and the enemy jumps all over you and he points and says, look at this one, God. Look at what they just did. Jesus jumps in and says, that one's mine. I know he's not perfect. I know I didn't get a great deal when I gave him my life, but he's mine and I love him. He is covered so we have that redemption, that intercession in Jesus Christ. So if you begin to feel condemned, that's not God. Again, we have to learn to discern the difference between condemnation and conviction. I believe that conviction is sweet. It's that sweet conviction of God that doesn't hit you or drive a, a dagger in your heart, but you just know. It almost brings you to tears because it's such a sweet conviction, and you know that God is telling you something that needs to change in your life. But Jesus does not condemn. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 17. Hebrews chapter 4, excuse me, verse 15. Hebrews 4, 15. He says, for we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. We are judgmental people. The human race, they're very judgmental people. You see someone and you, you immediately paint a picture of that person depending upon how they're dressed, depending upon what clothes they wear, designer clothes, or what kind of car they drive. It's very, very easy to make uh, a judgment call as to that person. And it's very easy for someone who has no money to see somebody driving in a $50,000, $150,000 vehicle to make a judgment call and go, well, they have no idea what it's like to be poor. But that might not be true, huh? They may have come from nothing. They may have worked hard. It, it is still America. And they might have worked hard. They may have invested. They may have gotten a, an inheritance. Something might have happened in their life to put them in a different position. This is God telling us through Hebrews that he gets it. He understands. You and I can't say, well, but God doesn't understand. We can't say God doesn't understand what it's like to be hungry. God doesn't understand what it's like to be tempted. God doesn't understand what it's like to be human. You and I can't say that because it's simply not true. Hebrews 4, 15, for we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. The priesthood devolved into something that could be bought. 
Instead of it being holy, instead of it being high, it became something that was very, very base and very, very carnal. And it was very common for the priesthood to be passed along to the next heir. And then he would pass it on to his next heir. And they would, it would stay in the family. Sometimes the priesthood could be bought or sold and it could be passed along into the family. And as we know, truly being born again doesn't get passed on from one generation to the other. You can't pass it on because all of us Christian parents would love to really pass on being born again to our kids. But you realize you can't. They've got to accept it for themselves. So by the second or third generation, a lot of times the priests were very, very corrupt. And they were so separate from the people, from the workaday people, because they had become very wealthy, very rich, charging more money for the sacrifices than they should have charged. That's why Jesus got so angry and overturned the, the, the tables when he was in there, saying, my house is a house of prayer. You know, you guys are a den of thieves. You don't belong here in the temple. And that's why he wants them to know that Jesus is not like that person who can identify and could care less, really, about what you're going through. We see further in Hebrews, in other passages, I won't go into those passages right now, but I'll give you an idea where he talks about the priesthood getting to the point to where you don't even know if after you go in and confess that you're not confessing it to someone who's full of more sin than you are. You don't know if you're confessing it to somebody that as soon as you leave, he's going, oh boy, that person's in trouble and goes out and gets drunk. You don't, you don't know. But with Jesus, you know that it's all high and holy and righteous and good. That's the point that he's making. And in Psalm 14 verses 1 and 2. Psalm 14 verses 1 and 2. He says, let my prayer be set before you as incense. Let my prayer be set before you as incense. And lifting up of my hands as the evening sacrifice. Now you might go, well, I'm a pretty conservative guy. The lifting of the hands, you know, that's just not my thing. I don't think God's worried about it. Really, I, I don't. He might be worried about the reason you can't raise your hands, but he's not worried about the hands. Those are just an outward sign. I remember that uh, when Becky and I went saved, we went to a fairly uh, conservative church. And uh, we started meeting a lot of charismatic people. And they seemed so excited and they seemed so on fire for the Lord that we wanted to we wanted to see what this was all about. So we started going to a, a charismatic church and, and we're seeing people enjoying, you know, their worship. And, and you, you know, you, you kind of want to raise your hand, but you're going, you know, I'm going to call 911 if I raise my hand. And so you're, you're kind of intimidated to, to raise your hands. But I mean, there, it's a charismatic church. Everybody's raising their hands, but, but you're a little intimidated to do it. And I you know, you kind of start out like, no, how you start out is like this. You start out with them on your knees because it's down under the chair backs. Nobody can see you do it. So, you, you know, you start out on your knees. And, and God begins to work, you know, work on you, and they, they start kind of, kind of, you know, going up. You finally get to the place, and I remember God speaking to me directly one Sunday morning, and he said, you know, you're worried about what everybody else is doing instead of using this time to give me praise. And it spoke to my heart in such a way, I thought, you know what, this is really between me and God, not anybody else. It's between me and the Lord. This is an opportunity for me to praise the Lord. You watch a football game, you're up in front of the TV, <laughs> and praising the Lord, you know. We get real vocal and excited about the other things, but with Jesus, we're just so conservative and so reserved. Now, I'm not saying you, that one is better than the other one. That's not what I'm saying. I'm just saying that with me, I had to ask myself, why, 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 why do I not do this when I have an opportunity to praise God? And for me, it was an issue of pride. It may not be for everybody else, and someone else may just be a really... Um, uh, what am I looking for? Shy, a real shy individual, and that's just not their thing. But God, I thank God he looks at the heart. 
Okay, I want you to notice that he is offering it for the prayers of all saints. Not just some of the saints, but for all the saints that have gone before and will go after. Look at verse 4. And the smoke of the incense with the prayers of the saints ascended before God from the angel's hand. Our prayers are acceptable because of Jesus. That's what makes them so sweet. We can go to the Lord and ask him anything. Anything. We can go and ask him anything. We can even share with him our doubts. We can even be mad at him. Do I think it's wise? No, but we can be mad at him. Come on. We've all been upset with the Lord for not doing what we wanted him to do or the loss of a loved one, haven't we? And yet he doesn't get offended. He doesn't go, okay, well, that's strike three. You're done. You're out. Give me the eraser. Those to the Lamb's Book of Life. There's John. Got rid of that one. Now only 40 million, 200. You know, he doesn't do that. That's not what God does. He's our Father. He listens and he cares about us. So here is this incense of prayers, and it ascends from the angel's hands up to the Lord. That is acceptable to him. Now, how appropriate that ascends before God from the angel's hands. Because without the cross, there would be no saints. Have you ever thought about that? Without the cross, there is no Christianity. There are no saints. There are no prayers because they won't do any good. They, they mean absolutely nothing. Because all of those would go to an angry God. You see, Jesus, Jesus puts it together. Jesus makes us acceptable. So it's very appropriate, very appropriate that these prayers go to God and he's pleased with them. Look at verse 5. Then the angel took the censer, filled it with fire. Now it's going to begin. Fills it with fire from the altar and threw it to the earth and there were noises, thunders, lightnings, and an earthquake. So here are the prayers of the saints. It's like the Lord saying, okay, now it's time, guys. Now it's time. I've heard all the prayers and now it's time. God is loving and God is forgiving. God is gracious. God is slow to anger. We know all of those things. But he would not be a righteous God if he didn't do what he said he would do. He's given plenty of time, and now it's time for this judgment. Now, it seems as though this is the same golden censer. It's the same censer that carried the prayers that becomes a fiery weapon of judgment for those who are still dwelling upon the earth. The same fire that purifies also destroys. How appropriate for Jesus' ministry. The cornerstone. Some stumble at the cornerstone and some build on it. Some trust in it. To us, those of us that are Christians, it's life for us. But for those who don't know him, it becomes a huge stumbling block. And you have people all the time saying, you know, Christianity is too narrow. Yes, it is. There's got to be, you know, door number two and door number three, not just door number one. Well, I'm sorry, but there's, but there's not. There's one door, and that door is Jesus Christ. It is the same fire that purifies, but also destroys. It's amazing to me. That church after church after church after church after Sunday after Sunday after Sunday after Sunday can hear the message of God's love and still reject his forgiveness. They're just, they're blow, I mean, I, I get it because I did it for quite a few years. But it still blows my mind. Once you come to know Jesus Christ, you look back on it and you go, man, I so much wish I would have done this at a much younger age when people were trying to tell me about Jesus Christ, you basically tell them, look, guys, God loves you. God cares for you. No matter what you've ever done, God will forgive you, no matter what it is. You might be sitting there and going, but you don't know what I've done. No, and I don't want to know. But God knows, and God forgives you. 
God will forgive you. That's all in Jesus Christ. And you tell people, God can heal your marriage. God can, can heal your drug addiction. God can make you into the man that you're supposed to be or into the woman that you're supposed to be or the high school student you need to be or the child. God can change those things if you're willing and you will let him. And yet you tell him that, he will exchange your old life for a brand new one. The only thing you've got to do is let go. The only thing you've got to do is quit sitting on the throne of your life and let God have it. That's all you've got to do. And you can have a whole brand new life. And you tell folks that, and they go, no, I'd rather hang on to my old life. God might make me quit doing this, or God might make me quit doing that. So I'll hang on to my old life. And some people continue to go through a lot of years being absolutely broken absolutely miserable and some on their deathbed come to know Jesus Christ and some curse his name on their deathbed. But Christ is always there. Some would just rather walk in the fire of sin rather than being baptized in the fire of God's Holy Spirit. You know guys, I am convinced there are some things in life that we're powerless against without Christ. I believe that people are capable of horrendous things. And I believe that most people are capable of horrendous things. Put in the right set of circumstances. The old walk a mile in my shoes. It's so easy for us to judge someone and just think that they're, they're just bad, they're just corrupt. But I've watched God change hearts. People that you just thought would never come to know Jesus Christ, and they change. They are a different individual. I've watched it. I've seen it. I've seen it in our own church, and I've seen it many, many times, and I saw it in my own life, and I saw the Lord help me overcome some things that I never thought in my life I would ever be able to overcome, and I know that's the testimony of a lot of you folks. Hebrews 10, 26. Hebrews 10, 26. It puts it this way. He says, For if we sin willfully after we have received the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a certain fearful expectation of judgment and fiery indignation which devours the adversaries. Let it be known that today you have received the knowledge of the truth. And probably many times before today, but for sure today, you have received the knowledge of the truth. Now, a lot of people misunderstand Hebrews chapter 10, verses 26 and 27. Because they think that if they sin or make a mistake after they come to know Jesus Christ, that they lose their salvation. That it's gone. That is not what this means. It is not what it means. Let's go through it again. For if we sin intentionally, after we have received the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins. Now, what is the greatest sin that you can commit? Rejecting Jesus Christ. If you reject Jesus Christ, there is no sacrifice for sins. You don't have it. Because you have rejected Jesus Christ. To say that a Christian, if he sins, after he gets saved, no longer has salvation would be ridiculous because we were sinners before we got saved and we're going to be sinners after we got saved. We may sin less, but we're not sinless. Right? So it's important that we know and that we understand this. If you and I reject Jesus Christ for whatever's behind door number two or whatever's behind door number three, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins for you. It's there. But there's only one way to get there. The only way to the Father is through the Son. What effect will this fire have on you? This morning, tomorrow, next week? Will that fire have a purification effect on you? 
or will it have a destructive effect on you? You guys, we all know folks that were once involved in this church or your church or if you're visiting some church. They were actively involved. They were, they, they were doing things that looked like they really loved the Lord, right? I mean, if you would have asked them if they were a Christian, they would have said yes. If anybody asked you if they were a Christian, you would have said yes. And yet, they, they're, they're, they're nowhere. They're nowhere. And not that attendance is everything, but it does say something, doesn't it? And here's the thing. They had a choice. There was a choice to let God come in and reveal your heart, expose that heart, and say, God, clean me up. But there's also that other choice that says, eh, not now. I'm doing too many other things I'm afraid that you're going to take away. And your heart breaks because God only knows who's saved and who's not saved. So you look back at that individual and you go, were they saved or did they ever really come to a knowledge of Jesus Christ? And I'm glad only God knows because I would hate that job trying to figure out who's saved and who's not saved. But God knows. But you got to ask yourself, if, if we are an individual that never, never dives in, have we really accepted it? If we sit at the side of the pool and just, you know, put your toes in and dangle the water a little bit, is that really being born again or is that just a religious experience? If we, if we always hold back, if God doesn't have us, is that truly being born again or not? If we're still the same person we used to be or worse after we say we have a knowledge of Jesus Christ, is it true? And I can't, like I said, I can't judge that for you. You can't judge that for me. But God knows. So for me, it's like, why, why not just jump in? If I'm going to be a Christian, why not just jump in? Why not just let the Holy Spirit just, it's like being in water. You know, letting, letting the water just in, engulf you so that you got all of God, all of the Holy Spirit. A lot of people want just a little cup full. You know, I'll just take a little cup full. I'll just, I want a little bit of God, but I don't want him messing with my, my activities. I don't want him messing with my sleep. I don't want him messing with anything. I don't want God messing anything with my life. So I'll take a little bit, a little cup, but diving in? No, I, I don't think I'm going to dive in. Like I said, I'm glad I don't have to be the one that makes that but with God, it's not even a decision. It just is or it isn't because he, he knows. Okay, back on earth, we're seeing these cataclysmic judgments taking place on the earth. Now, no doubt that atmospheric physicists are going to be attempting to scientifically explain these events rather than to deal with their sin. When the Christians are all gone, they're going to try to explain that. Like I said maybe a couple weeks ago, and that's one of the theories is all the Christians, because they're so backwards, because they're so stupid, they're holding society back. So some alien race came and took them all. And that alien race is going to take them, teach them, enlighten them, and then maybe bring them back. Because you see, people are so stuck in their sins, they're not going to say, this is exactly what the Bible talked about. They're not going to say that. Even if they suspect it, it's not going to be on the news. If you watch the news, there's very little about Christianity that ever comes up. If you watch a TV show that portrays a Christian, how do they portray him? As an idiot, right? So it's not going to be on the news to say, hey, all the Christians got raptured just like God said. No, it's going to be an alien race came and got those fundamentalists so they could reprogram them and our world could move on and become the world it was designed to be. Look at verses 6 and 7. So the angel, the seven angels who had the seven trumpets appeared 
and prepared themselves to sound. The first angel sounded, and hail and fire followed, mingled with blood, and they were uh, thrown to the earth, and a third of the trees were burned up, and all the green grass was burned up. So these earth dwellers, those that are left on the earth at this time, they've just experienced an electrical storm plus a violent earthquake, and now it's followed by a heavenly hailstorm. We've seen this once before in Exodus chapter 9, verse 22, uh, 23 and 24, but with a little bit of a change. So if you have your Bibles, or if you can see it on the screen, Exodus 9, 23 and 24, it says, And Moses stretched out his rod towards heaven, and the Lord sent thunder and hail, and fire darted to the ground, and the Lord rained hail on the land of Egypt. Now, you guys remember the hailstorm? I, I talked about this. You remember the hailstorm about, what, two years ago, three years ago? How many of your cars got damaged? How many of you fixed it? No, I don't want to know that. But it got, they got torn up. And, and, you know, cars are not built like they used to be built, to where you could take a hammer and bounce it off the fender, and it just go boop, 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 it just bounce. Now, if you did that, your whole fender would fall apart. Everything's much thinner, gas mileage, all the reasons for that. But that hailstorm, those things were like golf ball size hail, and it damaged the, the, the roof of your car, it damaged the hood, it damaged the trunk, and every once in a while, even now, you'll be driving along, and you're going, okay, he was in the hailstorm a few years ago, because you'll look over, and somebody, you know, their car still looks like that, either no insurance, or they decided not to spend the insurance on the car, so you get an idea of what's going on, and in Moses' case, it was thunder and hail, and fire darted to the ground. And the Lord rained hail on all the land of Egypt, so there was hail, fire mingled with the hail, so uh, very heavy that there was none like it in all the land of Egypt since it became a nation. So first time it was local, this time it's going to be worldwide. And different than Egypt, this one's going to be mixed with blood, okay? So you're going to have your normal uh, hailstone, uh, hailstones that are going to go on, but there's going to be blood falling uh, from the sky uh, at the same time time. And on top of that, because of this and because of the other things, one-third of all the trees and of all the grass, it will be burned up. Now, keep in mind, this will follow a severe drought. So, it's going to make it that much easier for things to burn. Look at verses 8 and 9. Then the second angel sounded, and something like a great mountain burning with fire was thrown into the sea, and a third of the sea became blood. And a third of the living creatures in the sea died, and a third of the ships were destroyed. Now, this mountain doesn't seem to be like anything that John's ever seen before. That's why he uses that word like. He says it's something like a great mountain. Again, back to some speculation. What could this be? Is it possible that it could be a giant meteorite? Or an asteroid? Have you noticed over the last few years there's a lot more talk about things in Earth, I mean things in, in, the, in the cosmos coming to Earth. And they are already working on, they, they say that they're learning to mine some of these asteroids to get some of the stuff. Well, that's certainly true, but... It's also possible they're trying to figure out what they're made of so we can blow them up. Because if something the size that it could be comes to earth and hits, and we've, we've seen it before. We got craters all over the place with things from the cosmos who come in and hit the earth. So if something hits it, it could be a satellite. It could be some of the debris that, that we've put out there. I don't know if you know it, but there's so much space junk out there, and it's from time to time comes and hits the earth. Maybe scientists will see it coming. Maybe the world will watch it splash down. But whatever it is, it's going to be visible. It's going to affect, it's going to have a greater effect than an atomic bomb when it hits. A third of the sea life will die. Now, when it hits, there's going to be a tidal wave. It can't hit the ocean without there being a tidal wave after that. It's going to be so intense that it's going to destroy one-third of all the ships in the ocean. You know, when that hits and you got the tidal waves, whatever ships out there is going to be destroyed. No telling how tall these waves 
are going to be. One third of that ocean is going to be as blood. Now I want you to stop and think about this. What effect is that going to have on the food chain? No more red lobster. Well, I don't know, there may be a red lobster or two. But you get the idea. That food chain is going to change, change drastically. And for those that are still left on the earth, you can understand how gold is going to buy a slice of bread because the prices are going to go up so high. Revelation 8, verse 10 and 11. Revelation 8, verse 10 and 11. It says, Then the third angel sounded, and a great star fell from heaven burning like a torch, and it fell on a third of the rivers and on the springs of water. The name of the star is Wormwood. C.S. Lewis, read the book if you get a chance. The name of the star is Wormwood. A third of the waters became Wormwood, and many people died from the water because it was made bitter. This star, this great star, is more fluid in nature, it seems, than anything that has come before it. It's more like a it's more like a, a gigantic lamp or a gigantic torch that's hitting and coming to earth. And it has its own name, and that is wormwood. You'll see why. This word that is translated as wormwood is only used right here in the New Testament. And it kind of has a bit of an uncertain origin. But it comes from the Greek word absinthos, where we get our English word absinth, A-B-S-I-N-T-H. E. Webster's defines it as a green, bitter liqueur having the flavor of licorice and wormwood. But in the Old Testament, this same word was translated as hemlock, poison. So it's going to po poison, excuse me, many of the waters. And before people figure it out, all this is going on. There's been a drought. People are going to be drinking the water. And before they find out, there's going to be lots of people that have died. And even at that point in time, it's like they're going to have to figure out a way to purify it because they're still going to need water and water's going to be in short supply. Verse 12, we're almost done here. Then the fourth angel sounded and a third of the sun was struck and a third of the moon and a third of the stars so that a third of them were darkened. A third of the day did not shine and likewise the night. Now I don't know how scientists are going to explain this one away. But the way it's written, it doesn't seem as though it's just haze or clouds. The logical thing to think would be all this fire and brimstone, everything else is on fire. There's going to be so much haze that you can't see. You can't see anything. But I don't believe that that's exactly what it's saying here. I believe that God is doing this. It's, not, it's a supernatural cause. In Revelation, what makes this even a little more staggering is the fact that Revelation 16, verses 8 and 9 tells us that the sun's output is actually intensified. Listen to what Luke says in Luke 21, verse 25 and 26. He says, And there will be signs in the sun and in the moon and in the stars and on the earth, distress of nations, with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring. Men's heart failing them, men's hearts failing them from fear and the expectation of those things which are coming upon the earth for the powers of heavens will be shaken and yet people still won't give their hearts to Jesus. They'll hide themselves in the rocks and in the cliffs and uh, trying to protect themselves from all that's going on but still too stubborn to give their hearts to the Lord. It's like Pharaoh. Heart just gets so stubborn and so set in its ways. We've talked about that before, that sometimes you make a stupid decision and you're too proud to admit it was a stupid decision. So you just keep hanging on to it. Let me close with this. Revelation 8.13. And I looked, and I heard an angel flying through the midst of heaven, saying with a loud voice, Woe, woe, woe to the inhabitants of the earth. Not the Christians, guys. We're gone. Because of the remaining blasts of the trumpet and the three angels were about, who were about to sound. Now, I would think if everything up to this point hadn't got me that a flying angel would cause me to repent. But you never know. Evidently, it won't for many, many people. It's going to have very little effect upon them. 
But I want you to notice in this last part, this flying angel is visible. He's visible. And he cries out this message. And in the world of the technology we have today, we already have the ability by satellite to televise this. You can imagine if God tarries a few years, what the technology will be like. Everyone will see this flying angel flying to and fro and saying, woe to the inhabitants of the earth because of what is about to come. In other words, you know what he's saying? You ain't seen nothing yet. With all that we've studied and that with all that we've seen, this flying angel is basically saying, you haven't seen anything yet. And you know, to me, that testifies of God's love. He's still giving people on the earth an opportunity to still come to know him as Lord and Savior. He keeps sending messenger after messenger after messenger, and we just kill the messengers. We get rid of them because we don't want to hear what they've got to say. In Peter chapter 3, 2 Peter chapter 3, it says that God is merciful. He's long-suffering towards us. And he's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. So guys, I want to challenge you with something. If you've given your life to Jesus Christ, ask God to put a fire in you that burns for the lost. Now I'm not saying God send me to some remote part of the third world country. He might do that, that might be your heart's desire. But what I am saying is, let's not forget that we're not done. We're, we're not done. It doesn't matter if you're 13 or if you're 103. We're not done. This is not just a, uh, you know, the 30-yard, 50-yard dash. This is a marathon. So don't unplug. Don't back off. Don't assume that it's all somebody else's job. We're here to tell people about Jesus Christ. Be bold. Don't worry about whether somebody's going to reject you because your faith in Jesus Christ. They rejected him first. They hated him first. So that's going to happen to us. But here's the thing. You hold the truth. As a Christian, you hold the truth of God in your hands and in your mind and in your heart. You hold him. Don't hold on to him so tight that he can't get out. Let him out. Tell people about the Lord.